You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about sports in the state of Michigan? You can't handle the truth! Well, we're giving you the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media, the show that provides research and statistics about all the Detroit and Michigan sports teams, whether fans like it or not, and detects, exposes, and reveals actual and hidden facts and truth that the mainstream media doesn't want you to know. No junk, no entertainment, no homerism, no slappiness, no coddling, no pop culture, no conspiracy theories, no opinions, no shilling, and no fluff. Head over to our website, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast, podcast.com follow us on twitter periscope and instagram at michigan underscore truth and like and share our verified facebook page the michigan sports truth podcast also listen to us on spreaker Castbox, iHeartRadio, google podcast apple podcast via itunes and spotify and like staples media on facebook <laughs> The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers, nor does it represent or compete against any mainstream media in the state of Michigan. It is also not for entertainment or debating purposes. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And it is for every sports fan's own good because the truth is out there. And welcome to another episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media. Taylor Phillips along with Ed Smith and Frank Vajner here. Follow me on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at DT2Phillips. Ed Smith on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at EdSmith313. And Frank Vajner on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at Frank underscore Vajner. My opening statement, the Lions have entered a new quarterback era, except it's not as exciting as some may think, while Matthew Stafford has finally joined a winning team. Ed, what is your opening statement? Then we'll go to Frank. My opening statement, Taylor, is that it was inevitable. It was bittersweet, but it had to be done. Matthew Stafford has moved on from the Lions, and now the team must begin its full entire rebuild. Yes, true. Frank? My opening statement is, as one era comes to an end in Detroit, a new one begins. The one that ends is the Matthew Stafford era. And granted, it's a shame that he hasn't, wasn't able to win anything of value in Detroit, but I would say most Lions fans would hope that he goes and wins the whole darn thing wherever he in L.A. Yep, and we'll talk about others as well. Before we get started, we want to remind everyone to download the all-new social sports mobile app, Vigit. Enter the referral code STABLES, capital S and the letter B lowercase in the middle for Stables Media when you sign up. Available on the Apple App Store and Google Play. Download the Vigit app and sign up with the referral code STABLES. Michigan users can pre-register with its partner BetMGM and make a minimum deposit of $10 in exchange for 2,000 Vig coins. Take advantage of this opportunity, Michiganders. All right, so we begin our What's Your Great segment. Pencils down, everyone. It's time to find out what's your grade. The Lions have traded quarterback Matthew Stafford to the Los Angeles Rams for quarterback Jared Goff and two first-round draft picks in 2022 and 2023 and a third-round pick for this year. So, uh, Ed, we'll go to you and then we'll go to Frank. Jerry Goff may have had some issues with Sean McVay, the head coach of the Los Angeles Rams, and he uh, turned the ball over 38 times, 29 interceptions, nine fumbles his last 31 games. But Jerry Goff says he's happier in Detroit, and uh, he's going to work with Brad Holmes and Dan Campbell and the, co- the a new coaching staff in Detroit. So, Ed, go ahead. What is your grade? On the grade itself, I will give it an A, simply because of the fact they did it the right way in terms of Matthew Stafford. Stafford... I, I had a feeling that Stafford was going to be the one to initiate things this time around uh, in regards to what his future would look like. And according to reports uh, that I scoured and looked over this past week, it turns out those thoughts were true in terms of initiating talks wanting to, even before the GM and, and or coach uh, searches began. The fact that his uh, his home was listed last year, and despite the rumors of him being traded last offseason, it prompted him and his wife, or at least his wife at least, to go on, on, on social media and say, hey, trade us to L.A. So that should have been the first red flag right then and there. Stafford stuck it out for as long as he could, but at the end he wanted out. He sought a way out, and in the end he got what he wanted. He and Alliance ended this as amicably as possible. You know, you hate to see it. But in terms of what's best for Stafford and what's best for the team and the franchise moving forward, this was the best thing to do and the right move to do. So there's that aspect. As for what you got in return, essentially you got a swap. You swap one former first round, uh, number one overall pick for another. You swap, well, not a swap here, but, but in terms of you get in addition to that, you do get at least extra draft capita to build the right pieces to surround your new quarterback with, however long you may have them. 
And depending on how well or, or frankly, how not so well the Rams may do over the next couple of years, those first round picks may become more valuable. But that yet remains to be seen. But in terms of the deal that was done and in terms of other teams that were looking, uh, and, and as we know, other teams were vying in on the Matthew Stafford sleeve stakes, whether it be Carolina, whether it be Indianapolis, whether it be Washington, multiple teams, San Francisco, Denver, uh, you know, uh, the Lions potentially wanted a huge, massive offer that included Drew Locke, uh, but the Broncos eventually they backed out. Uh, essentially, essentially every team that Stafford either was intrigued by or looked into, he wanted to accept for the Patriots. And for obvious reasons, you know, you don't have to go no further. Knowing that Matt Patricia went back to Bill Belichick to be on the coaching staff, I'm sure Stafford wanted no parts of being reunited with the bearded one. In terms of his ultimate destination, I think, but the fact of him really bonding with Sean McVay or coming into a good rapport with Sean McVay or rather Sean McVay falling in love with Matthew Stafford and just being persistent on it, uh, it convinced Stafford, okay, he must. it made him feel wanted, valued, and thinking, hey, okay, the pieces that's out here, I already have a home out here with me and my wife and family. To me, this seems like a, a right fit on, on all ends of the accord. So considering the fact that, hey, you fulfilled Stafford's wishes, uh, you ended this thing as amicable as possible. He got a great haul, in my view, in return, and both sides came out as satisfied as possible. I got to give this one an A. Yeah, me too. Frank, you agree the same too, right? Absolutely, I do. I got to give it an A. I mean, this is like Ed said, this was a move that had to happen, whether we as fans wanted to accept it or not. You give Brad Holmes credit for making his first big move. And I even said last week, guys, watch for the L.A. Rams as a team to possibly trade for Stafford. And lo, and I'm not trying to say that I could predict the future, but I pretty, I kind of pretty much called it. But all that aside, I love the return that the Lions got. You got I mean, yeah, you do take on Jared Goff, and I know people are going to complain about his contract being bad. Well, I do remember reading that it's either after 2021 or 2022, if he goes and stinks up the joint, they can cut him, and they won't, uh, and there won't be any dead money against the salary cap. That will so be there's that. Th- yeah, that will be 2022 if they decide to All cut right, him after this Ed. year. Yeah, the cap hit would have been from 15 to $7 million if they decided to come after 2021. And then if, it's, if they wanted to cut him after 2022, then that's when the cap hit goes to zero. Exactly. Yeah, so it's not all a bad deal having to at least have golf for two years. You're not mm-hmm. married to him. I mean, as for the draft picks you got, depending how well – it's going to depend how well the Rams do. If they go and, and get to at least the NFC Championship or – win the Super Bowl, obviously it's going to be near the end of the first round. But I've also heard people say that the Rams could be headed for salary cap hell because they're going to end up owing new deals to guys like Michael Brockers and to Robert Woods and to a few of their other big-name players, too. They'll have tackle, too, most importantly. Yeah, well, I believe Andrew Whitworth, I've heard rumors that he might be retiring. Yeah, that could be a potential big hole, though. Yeah, so obviously they're going to have to address that. And, and that's on top of, of the money that they're already paying Jalen Ramsey and I think paying Aaron Donald and, of course, now taking on Stafford's contract as well. You're absolutely correct, Ed. So it, the Rams are pretty much in. It's it's Super Bowl or bust for them within the next two years. But if they, but let's say if things go completely off the rails, then the Lions will likely end up having the pick in probably the low teens. I'd say I guess maybe so. top 10 if it, if things really go off of it, if things really go bad, because I've even heard rumors that Sean McVay's seat is getting hot as well. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens out there. And obviously, like I said in my opening statement, I'm sure a lot of Lions fans wish Matt Stafford the best and hope he does get to win something of value. So, But all that aside, in the end, this gets an A from me. All right. So we all agreed in an A. That's the Vigit What's Your Great segment brought to you by the Vigit Sports mobile app. Referral code Staples for Staples Media. Capital S, lowercase letter B in the middle. Also, the Lions have hired Chicago Bears linebackers coach Mark DeLeon as linebackers coach for the Lions. Ed, we'll go to you and then we'll go to Frank. I will give him a B uh, on the surface. I'm going to wait and see what the rest of the uh, what the results may produce. But knowing that uh, Mike DeLeon, knowing that what he had done in Chicago – helping up teach up guys like Roquan Smith and also for the past couple of years having to work behind work with guys such as Khalil Mack uh, that uh, obviously you saw what dividends it helped provided 
for the Chicago Bears defense as a whole. Offense, quarterback, that's another story. But their defense, at least they had it on, on lock. Now, in terms of what he can provide for Detroit, we know that linebacker was uh, a severe, severe detriment throughout the entirety of Matt Patricia's era here. I don't know what this means for in terms of keeping or potentially moving on from Jared Davis or whoever uh, they may find as potential upgrade at that spot. But this was one severe area of weakness that they needed to target. And I like the hire uh, on its value, but I want to see what he can produce in terms of uh, getting more out of production from that from that uh, from that core, as well as potential. Uh, now, obviously, with, with Brad Holmes being GM, it comes down to him defining the right talent at that position. But in terms of having the right coach to coach up said players in said position, I like it, but I want to wait to see more. So I'm going to give it a B. All right, B from Ed. Frank, you're up next. Well, I guess you can put me in the same boat as Ed for pretty much the same reasons. I give it a B, and kind of what Ed said. DeLon is somebody who worked with Roquan Smith, Khalil Mack, Danny Trevathan. Very good group of linebackers. So, I mean, at least he can coach guys up. But it's all really going to come down to who does Brad Holmes get in for him to coach because this current linebacking core, the Lions, Jared Davis, I'm not sure if they're going to keep him or give up on him. Jelani Tavai, I would say, is probably not going to be kept around much longer if I had Harbor guess and probably a guy like like uh i forget which oquara brother off the top of my head is a linebacker who's julian and romeo i believe it's julian since romeo is on the d-line yeah i knew i knew one of them was defensive line one was a linebacker Mm -hmm. i just couldn't remember which one so hate to rub salt in the wound but just just a reminder you guys could have had devin bush you could have had him. He was right there staring you in the eye, and you pick a tight end. But I digress. P.J. <laughs> Hawkinson by name. And Devin yeah. Bush went to the Steelers. Yeah, so, I mean, I'll be interested to see who Brad Holmes does bring in via free HC or even draft for that matter. So I'll give it, I'll give this a B for now, but I'm willing to let the results pan out first before we can really give this a good evaluation. So, uh, Frank, your grade was a B as well? Yes. All right. So we all grade it. We all grade Mark. So we all grade Mark Dion, Mark DeLeon, a B. One last grade, Mark Brunel as quarterbacks coach, from NF, according to NFL Network. Ed, we'll start with you again. Uh, you know, I'm going to give this one a B plus with a potential A minus, depending on what he does with Jared Goff. I believe now at this point uh, it is huge homework assignment for Mark Brunel to not not only bring back some confidence into Goff. Obviously, that, it helps. I think Dan Campbell's going to help with, with being the head coach with his motivating mumbo-jumbo. That's going to come into play, too. But in terms of the QB coach of finding the right X and O's, uh, how to lead and change an audible at the line of scrimmage, making your reads, et cetera, et cetera. I think for a young quarterback like Goff, who know better than a guy who has been in the thick of things, proven veteran, tremendous talent, you could probably say borderline Hall of Famer potentially, and Mark Brunel. And so I think his knowledge of the game and what he brings to the table could help tremendously in the development, uh, nurturing, and, or I should say redevelopment, nurturing and growth of jared goff as a player so i'm going to give this a high high b plus and if all things go well i have to write the changes to an a in the future all right we'll keep our eyes on him frank your turn i'm going to give this a b plus probably not quite as high as ed is but again i'm willing to at least willing to sit and wait and let it see how it improves down the line i mean brunel is somebody who has been in the league He's coached in the league for a few years. I think he's going to play a big role in helping Jared Goff kind of get his mojo back. And also keep in mind, guys, if the Lions decide to take a quarterback in the draft to be the backup to Goff or possibly take over a starter, Brunel will likely end up having to groom him too. So Mm -hmm. I'm I'm giving this a B-plus for now. But again, with results, I could give this an A. Or A minus. Yes. At least. So we all grade at a B plus, maybe later an A minus if results turn out good. So that is our What's Your Great segment for the Lions brought to you by the Vigit Sports Mobile app. Referral code STABLES, capital S, lowercase letter B in the middle when you sign up. And please do so, especially when you're in the state of Michigan. The Red Wings uh, now 2 7 and 2. They lost to the Dallas Stars 7 to 3. They got swept by the Stars and then they. Uh, got swept by the Panthers, except they got one point in that first game against the uh, Florida Panthers at Little Caesars Arena, 3-2 in overtime, and then they lost 3-2 again, except 
in regulation in the second game, and then they lost badly to the Tampa Bay Lightning at Amelie Arena, 5-1. to one. The way I saw that first goal, Jet Blaschel made yet another line change at the wrong time, allowing that first goal to happen. Victor Hedman scoring that goal top shelf against Thomas Grice. That was not the defense's fault. That was Blaschel's fault, mostly. And Thomas Grice, uh, he could not stop that shot. So probably not his fault either, just Blaschel's fault. And that's going to be one of our bonus questions in five questions at the end. So, um, Ed, we'll go to you, and then we'll go to Frank. Ed, part of tanking, but Blaschel just keeps on being an idiot. Yeah, he's not he's seemingly making the right adjustments to have his team fully engaged at the right moments. And I don't know if, if it's, it's starting to lead to some of his players having resentment or not having full confidence. That's the, like the worst thing you could have is to have your team lose total confidence in you. And the fact that this is now, what, seven losses in a row, I believe. Yeah, it's looking bad and early. The oh, yeah. That, yeah, and the fact that it doesn't help, obviously, matters that, you know, the certain players had to be absent due to COVID-related practices. But that's not an excuse. Uh, you play with who you play. You show up. You do what you got to do. Now, if there is a bright spot, so to speak, there has been at least a consistent performer. Anthony Mantha has at least has had a point um, in, in all – Three in the past three games in this past week, he was a plus two in this last game against Florida, and then the overtime game before that, he was a plus one. He's had two goals and an assist in the past three games. He's been what you wanted to expect to see out of one of your three best players between him, Tyler Bertuzzi, and of course your captain Dylan Lark. And when one is slacking, the other must pick up. That's what we've seen so far out of out of Mantha. So that's one, I guess you could say, silver lining. That's one positive aspect to look at. It would be that, but as, other than that, it's just. Ugh. I mean, it was going to be ugly, but I, again, I think we're going to see potential tests, a first true chess test for Eisman as his, gen, as his general manager spot, the same way that we saw for Brad Holmes. It was much earlier than expected for Brad Holmes, but when it came down to it, he made the, he made the call and he pulled the trigger. Now we got to wait to see what is Eisman gonna, exactly going to do. If it gets as bad as it's getting right now, we're talking 10, 15, even, what, 20 game losing streaks and abysmal performances and just shoddy, shoddy execution and X's and O's and little to no adjustments, Eisman may have no choice but to just pull the trigger and send Blash on his merry way. But yet, still, that remains to be seen. Yeah, and I ran into an article from the Detroit Free Press. I know it's uh, for subscribers only, paid subscribers only, but um, Helen St. James from the Detroit Free Press wrote an article the Detroit Red Wings uh, may not need to or might not fire Jeff Blaschel as head coach before the end of the season, but I highly doubt that that's true. But again, the Red Wings should not be in that kind of a hurry, but um, we'll see what happens. They were, they're tanking for the first overall pick yet again, hopefully with no COVID protocols this time, and hopefully that draft lottery is permanently removed and completely as well. Frank, you're up next. Before... I begin, I would like to say that I discovered a tweet from uh, Prashant Iyer, which he posted during the game. It has been 464 days since a goaltender other than Jonathan Bernier won a game for the Detroit Red Wings. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh. That is that is how yep. bad it's gotten. I've noticed that. <laughs> yeah, cue uh, urinating trees, cackling laugh here if you want to. Oh, that's what it felt like for me just then. Oh, my goodness. Still enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, but my thing about tonight's performance, it was just downright abysmal. And I've said it time and time again, there is no effort being put forth. I admit that this team doesn't have a ton of talent on it. But you know what? It's been upgraded since last year thanks to guys steve eiserman has brought in but if the players aren't putting forth the effort who does that fall on the head coach seven straight losses is more and i mean more than unacceptable regulation and overtime yes combined regulation and, and overtime combined and at what point is steve eiserman gonna say enough's enough we got to make a change, whether that's making Dan Bilesma the interim head coach and a sacrificial lamb, or possibly bringing Doug Huda to be the interim head coach. Either of those guys has to be a better option at this point. And I'm not saying it's going to make the Red Wings a average team, much less a contending team, but I think you're at least going to see a better effort put forth 
by the players. And also, in reference to the article that Helene St. James wrote, Taylor, she said that Blaschel is owed $1.6 million this season, and the, wet, and the Red Wings are losing money because of COVID and not having fans and all this, that, and the other. How much money is Chris Illich worth? Man, not very much, to say the least. Well, but, oh. Chris Illich... Chris Illich is worth billions, with a B, to anyone listening. So, what the, is going to stop him from cutting a check for? According to the payroll, happened? yes, but the Red Wings' performance and the uh, and all that other stuff, plus the parking lots not paying dividends, Chris Illich not worth as many billions as you think. True, but we we do know that Chris is a tremendous cheapskate. I mean, for God's sake, he traded away Doug Fister for pennies on the dollar when he. A, it was unnecessary, and B, it was just a completely stupid move to do for, for cost purposes, quote-unquote. And it was just one example or a, a, a red flag of what this team's tenure was going to look like once Mike passed on. Yeah, and Chris Illich pulling Dave Dombrowski's strings in between the 2013 and 2014 seasons. That is just ludicrous and ridiculous. But it goes back to what I said. Chris Illich is worth, um, I would say, a couple billion dollars. What, cutting a check for $1.6 billion is a drop in the bucket for him. And you guys know how much it grinds my gears when billionaires cry poor. So the right thing that needs to happen is just give Blaschel his $1.6 million and tell him to get out of town. This isn't working. You bring your interim in and then... Depending how things go, you go and hire somebody new in the off season. Who that could be, too early to tell at this point in time. But Blaschel has to go now, and I'm sure we're going to get to that in five questions. Of course. Same for the Pistons. They uh, won last Thursday at home over the Lakers, 107-92, to before uh, starting that West Coast road trip very rough. 118-91 loss at the Golden State Warriors. Then they had their uh, Denver Nuggets game postponed, and then they lost to the Utah Jazz, 117 to 105. The Pistons started out very, very slow, just like the Red Wings started out earlier prior to this podcast. So, um, Ed, we'll go to you, and then we'll go to Frank. Pistons are doing the same thing the Red Wings are doing. The Pistons are now 5 and 16, if I'm correct. Yes, if they're 5 and 16, and they're impending. They're going to be facing the Suns to, uh, on Friday with Chris Paul. I'm assuming Chris Paul is playing, we don't know. But let's say CP3 plays, you know, even if he doesn't play, you're still dealing. You got Devin Booker to deal with, so I'm expecting another L unless something miraculous happens. But going on to what they've gone through this past week, up and down, and just flat out ugliness, mostly negative, and then almost flat out ugly the past couple of uh, what we saw against Utah. First and foremost, Golden State. They put up as good an effort as you could possibly do against a team like that. But at the end of the day, it just comes down to who has the better talent, who's the better team. And we knew from the get go, Golden State was the better team. They're in the tougher conference. They have. They're key, valuable players. Yes, they don't play Thompson, but they still have Steph Curry and Draymond Green and other people and other pieces who, who Steph can facilitate and get involved. And so far, it's, it's a point where Golden State, they're, you know, they may be only a couple games over 500, but you feel more confident about their chances of making the playoffs this season as compared to last year because at this point, Steph already broke his wrist, Clay was already out, and KD was gone. And this is a far different Golden State team than what we saw last year. Not vintage, but still something different. As for the Pistons, it started to get more ugly because in terms of performance and how they look, you got Clay and Draymond just ripping Rodney Magruder, essentially calling him a scrub and a bum without calling him a scrub and a bum. Then you follow that up by then you have your game postponed against, against Denver. And then you follow that up with a absolute dog doo-doo performance against Utah, at least in the first half to the point where Blake Griffin walked off the court into the locker room, ripped his jersey almost in half. I saw the video footage on WXYZ Channel 7 in Detroit. I saw it on, on the news earlier today, and it just it was the perfect snapshot on how this season has been for this team. And frankly, it was kind of expected, but still doesn't make it any less pretty to watch up close. And Blake Griffin, uh, it shows how sick of being on a losing team he really is, especially the Pistons. They definitely need to fire Dwayne Casey, which is a, another part of one of our bonus questions in five questions. Frank, you're up next. Yeah, I had heard about Blake Griffin ripping his jersey off at halftime. I didn't happen to see the video of it. I guess I'm going to have to look that up halftime? later. Halftime? I thought it was after the, the game. game. Uh, okay, the my game. bad. 
Okay, my bad. I sorry. I oh, okay, I was it. curious. It could have been one of those two. Either way, this, this frustration was 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 the main piece of the sediment here. How yeah. bad? Yeah. And you know what? I can't fault him for being angry. Losing sucks, and nobody should like losing. I know that the Pistons are trying to rebuild, but the problem is they should have traded away Griffin when they had the chance to. Now he's been dealing with all sorts of injuries, and I'm not sure you're going to be able to send him somewhere unless you can really find a sucker who wants to add some depth in their front court for the postseason or something like that. So we'll sit, we'll kind of see how it goes. I mean, look, getting blown out by the Jazz, I'm not going to get too worked up about it because the Jazz have just been on a whole different planet this year in the Western Conference. So that said... The Pistons are going to have to move on from Griffin probably sooner rather than later if they want to at least get something in return. It's just yeah. I'm not sure who – I'm just not sure at this point who would want to take him on. I mean, whatever happened to that sign and trade chance? Is it still there? Hmm. I do not I'm – not, I'm not really sure if it's still there or not. I mean, I don't know if you could – the thing is he – He's pretty much near the end of his career. He's had his knee problems, other injuries. I'm just hoping that there's going to be some sucker of a GM out there, or maybe hopefully an owner who's going to want him bad enough to add to the front court for death purposes. And hopefully it's a contending team so he can at least get a championship ring. Because, I mean, look, Blake Griffin's been a guy who I've always respected his game ever since he was playing at the University of Oklahoma. And he gets to the NBA and... He's been in the league for, I would say, twelve, at least 12 years, but no ring. So hopefully he does get to at least end his career on a positive note. Yeah. Ed, you talked about this to us before, about that sign-and-trade deal. Yeah, I can see that as a possibility, but I, I don't know what GM will be willing to do that on a much older, much more weathered, much more injury-prone Blake Griffin than even what he was at the early point slash start of his career. Yes, he yep. can bring variables. Yes, he has made great adjustments to this game, and I commend him for that. But so, but it's when he is on there, and more often than not, he's not going to be it, especially at this point of his career. So that's the risk that you take on and what you seemingly and what you consider giving up any assets, whether it be players or draft picks, for a guy who could be out for the rest of the year on any given moment. Right. You know? And so, unless uh, the Billy King reanimates himself onto a onto a sucker idiot of a team, I don't see Blake's contract getting moved anytime soon. Right. And Blake Griffin, like Frank touched on just recently, and we talked about this many times before. Blake Griffin's health has been declining, and if it continues to decline, Blake Griffin might actually have to retire sooner than in five years. That's the point that I'm trying to express here. So that's Pistons. They got uh, the Suns at 9 on Fox Sports Detroit Plus on Friday. The Lakers in Los Angeles Saturday at 10 on Fox Sports Detroit. They're home against the Brooklyn Nets Tuesday at Little Caesars Arena at 7. And then they got the Indiana Pacers Thursday at 7 on Fox Sports Detroit. To college basketball, the Michigan State Spartans, they get absolutely crushed by the Rutgers Scarlet Knights 67-37 to last Thursday. And then they uh, lose to the Ohio State Buckeyes in Columbus last Sunday, 79-62. And then just recently, this past Tuesday, 84-70 lost to the number 7 Iowa Hawkeyes in Iowa, in Iowa City. Michigan State started off like 16-6 to a quarter of the way through the first half. Wow. That Rutgers game, first of all, Michigan State just was absolute flaming puke trash. But once they played the Ohio State Buckeyes and then the Ohio and then the Iowa Hawkeyes, they started to progressively get better. Wow. Are we seeing Tom Izzo, uh, his team of old, getting back into form? Ed, we'll go to you, and then we'll go to Frank. Well, you can't say they're getting back into form right now because they're not winning games. They've lost three in a row. and now Four in two, a row now. Yeah, four in a row now, right, considering all the postponements that they've had to deal with. Now After that Purdue game. Exactly. So now they're... Eight and seven overall. They're two and seven in the conference. They're second to last place. If it wasn't for the fact that, ne that Nebraska was an over and over five, Michigan State would be last. Okay, so that is a cause for concern. Whether or not you want to overlay it or underperform it or however you want to look at it, there should be concern about how this team is going to uh, even get to the tournament, let alone get to the first or second weekend of April uh, of March. I understand some players have left. Some players have. It was going to be hard to replace a guy like Cassius Winston. I understand that. I also understand. I think this is why, you know, 
in a bit of a similar direction, but not too similar because unlike Harbaugh, unlike Izzo, Harbaugh has done nothing in terms of accomplishments during his tenure in Michigan. But you can kind of parallel to what the Michigan football team has been going through this past year. Uh, abysmal performances, dealing with uh, COVID as well, most fam- most infamously as they had to essentially scrap the rest of their season due to COVID outbreak on their end. Uh, so what we're seeing from Michigan State basketball, you know, which just kind of plays into the whole narrative of how MSU basketball is equal to MSU f- Michigan football and vice versa with the football and basketball programs for each, pro- for each uh, school here. But uh it's still very troubling. Now, I appreciate the fact that they, they've gotten better in some of their performances. Like, I thought they did a, a, a standard, uh, as good of a job as you can against Iowa, knowing that they have a player in Luca Garza, who may very well be the upcoming top number one pick in this year's NBA draft, if all things are considered. But they still lost. A loss is still a loss, no matter how well you look at it or slice it. You can lose by 100 points or by one point. It's still a loss. So it comes down to better communication, number one, between Izzo and his players, and also finding ways to build better mental toughness because this is a type of stretch that will test your internal fortitude as well as mental toughness and chemistry as a team all around. I understand that between Izzo himself and his son and other players on the team, they've been racked with COVID, and my sympathies go out with them as well, but you can't use that as a crutch just the, way, just the way I didn't see or make any excuses for Michigan and Harbaugh stinging it up the way they did, even though they were dealing with COVID, you still got to go out there and play. You still got to coach, still got to execute. And they have not done that, and they have looked terrible as a result. I know the record is one thing, but in terms of Michigan State expectations, this was, I'm sure, if you're MSU, look, they're coming off of three Big Ten titles, three straight Big Ten titles, or at least a share of them. Yes, yeah. I understand you had to replace Cassius Winston, but still, you still all find a way to reload uh, on tremendous players at that school and at that program. So there's no excuse for how this team should have performed, has been performing, COVID or no COVID. Michigan went through the same doggone thing you guys did, and look what, they, what they've been doing this year. So there's no excuse. Yeah, and Michigan, by the way, still in delay until next Thursday as scheduled as of right now. 7 o'clock on ESPN at home at Chrysler Center against the Illinois Fighting Illini. Frank, what say you? As for the beatdown at Rutgers, I wasn't entirely surprised at that loss, given the fact that Michigan State had been off for almost three weeks because of COVID. But losing by 30 points and only putting up 37 points in 40 minutes of basketball that's inexcusable i don't care how long you've been off for now ohio state that's just a loss i'll roll with because again they're a better team the iowa loss the result kind of surprised me because they kept it close and actually led their bigs were able to hold their own against luca garza who i don't think and i don't think he's going to be the top pick in the nba draft i think that title's going to belong to kate cunningham but i think garza will be somebody who plays in the association i don't think that and look i think we can pretty much say no chance of Michigan State making the tournament this year. I think that ship has long since sailed. The streak comes to an end, oddly enough, in probably the same year where Duke's NCAA tournament streak could come to an end, or even can even Kentucky misses for the second time in less than a decade, and North Carolina misses for the second time in the last 15 years. You're seeing all these programs that have got basketball tradition losing out a lot. Yeah. And a lot of people, and a lot of people are saying, "Well, maybe it's due to the fact that they can't have fans there." And there might be some credence to that argument because you go to Cameron Indoor Arena or you go up to the Breslin Center; mm-hmm. those student sections are rabid. They're insane. That's like going, yeah, it's like going into a snake pit. And look, I've I've dealt with that being a high school coach, and I know how crazy student sections can get. But at the college level, holy smokes, it will drive. You- that's where you have to have your mental focus, and it gives your the home team an advantage because it can cause miscommunications. I mean, look, I've seen Michigan State games where the Izzone will be counting the shot clock wrong just to get the other team to force a bad shot, and sometimes <laughs> it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I think not having that feel of a home court there does play a little bit of a role in it, but I don't think that is the sole reason because 
I don't think anyone has stepped up enough to replace Cassius Winston. It's next man up, and also, and I'll say this again: Foster Lawyer is not a power five caliber point guard. Look, I watched him in a high school game or two when he was at Clarkston. Great high school player. Not good enough to play at a power five school. He's better off playing at a mid major, and I'll just leave it at that. So, in conclusion. Goodbye NCAA tournament streak for Michigan State, and I'm sure we'll have plenty to say about Michigan, even though they are out of action still. And that'll be still one of our five questions. But speaking of Michigan, their football team has lost a couple players. Zach Charbonnet, their running back, transferred to UCLA, and then quarterback Dylan McCaffrey transfers to Colorado, where his father is the head coach. So Wolverines will have to uh, recruit a couple players at running back. It was actually Northern Colorado. Yeah, Northern Colorado. Northern Colorado. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's go to five questions uh, right now. It's time for five questions on the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast. Question number one. Which team won the Stafford Goff trade, the Lions or the Rams? It can be both, too. Ed, we'll go to you, and then we'll go to Frank. See, it depends on what side are you looking at. Are you looking at what's the short-term goal versus the long-term goal? If you're going to say short-term, especially if they go on out and win a Super Bowl, obviously it's the Rams. But I'm going to go with the long-term route and say that knowing that you have a younger quarterback you could potentially work out with, and if things don't work out with, you won't take a substantial hit if you decide to move on a couple years from now. Uh, You're getting pieces, you're getting capita to see what you can do to build your team in the way you want it to be. In terms of how this goes for 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 Brad Holmes, the move that essentially fair or not is going to define his term as general manager, he had to make that decision less than two weeks or two weeks or so on the job. So it takes a lot of cojones to pull off what he just did and in the manner that he did. So I'm going to say for the sake of argument, the Lions will win this deal long term because, again, I don't know exactly as much as of a gamer Stafford has been. I don't know how many years he has left. And you're not, and there are some combustible elements that could make everything in, in, in Los Angeles go south in a hurry if things aren't as satisfactory as intended to be. Yeah, I would say it's close to a tie, but I still think the Lions won that trade too. Frank, what's your answer? I'm going to say the Lions won because of the long-term game. They got two first-round picks from the Rams as a result, as well as a third-round pick for this year as well. And like I said earlier... The Rams are in win-now mode. It's Super Bowl or bust for them. They've got probably two years. That's probably how long Stafford's got left, depending how healthy he can stay. And also keep in mind, the Rams have guys that they've got to pay a lot of money to. They're paying a lot of money to Jalen Ramsey. They're paying a lot of money to Aaron Donald. Michael Brockers is going to be doing a raise. Leonard Floyd is a free agent to be... Hey, and there's a guy, Robert Woods is going to need a new deal, and plus they also need somebody to replace Andrew Whitworth on their offensive line. So things are, it's pretty much a thin line the Rams are going to have to toe in order for them to consider some form of a victory as a result, because if this thing goes completely off the rails, they have almost no draft capital for the next three years, and they will have gone from 2017, I believe it is, until 2024 without a first-round pick. And look, I don't claim to be an expert on drafting, but if you're going that long without getting a first-round pick at all, or maybe even just one, because I don't think... I think they still might have a first this year. I'm not sure if they they do or if that was gone to Jacksonville as part of the Jalen Ramsey trade. That's not a good way to sustain success because you got to be able to get new guys and new talent into your system. So Super Bowl or bust for the Rams if they're to win it, but in the end, the Lions win this specifically because of long-term gain. Spot on. Question number two. How will Matthew Stafford fare with the Los Angeles Rams down the road? Ed? I think with Stafford, knowing that what he could potentially bring to the table with Sean McVay now guiding him in the offense, playing more to his strengths and what he wants to do, you know Goff excuse me, not Goff, but McVeigh is going to want Stafford to be his usual gunslinger self, self, 
throwing the ball downfield, challenging defenses way more than Goff ever could have ever dreamed in McVay's view, and knowing that the uh, the supporting cast that he has around him. Now, granted, the offensive pieces that were there on the Super Bowl run two years ago are not there now, but you still have a solid defense. You have a top 10, top 5 deep caliber defense with one of, if not the best defensive player in the game in Aaron Donald, and arguably the best corner in the game today in Jalen Ramsey. That's two major units on your defense being anchored by one guy. Matthew Stavern has not had that type of support since, what, 2014? Sue's last, which was in Dominican Sue's last year in Detroit, where you still had Calvin on the offense. You know, he hasn't had that type of support in seven years. So it's quite substantial to see of how Stavern's going to perform, especially now with this potential new fire underneath him. So I think Stavern will, will perform admirably well, if not extremely well. I don't know if it's going to be MVP type of caliber year, but I do believe he will, A, get them to the playoffs, and at least the divisional round, if not the NFC championship game, would be... NFC title game is definitely the ceiling, but I want to see Stafford win a playoff game before I can make that next proclamation. Yeah. Frank? I also happen to think that Stafford's going to do very well in L.A. because he's got he's building that relationship with Sean McVay, and McVay seems to be willing to just let him do what he does best and sit back there and throw it. I mean, he's going to have a lot better offense around him. Robert Woods, provided they get him signed to a new deal. Cam Akers at running back, kind of have that running game to take the pressure off of them if need be, plus a very strong defense to, ki- to help as well. Now, I know I've been saying it's Super Bowl or bust for the Rams. I, In reality, I do think that winning the NFC West is more than feasible. This isn't the gauntlet that the North has been in years past, and he's also got talent to help him win. I don't see San Francisco jumping back to the top with Jimmy G as their quarterback. And plus Seattle, I think, is not going to be able to keep things going because their roster doesn't have a ton of talent outside of Russell Wilson. And the Arizona Cardinals, as much as I do love Kyler Murray as a quarterback, until I see him actually win something of significance, I'm not going to go ahead and crown them. So a division win is definitely feasible. Getting to the divisional round, I could see that being done. Like Ed said, NFC Championship is the ceiling, but I really think given the way the Rams are constructed at the moment, it's Super Bowl or bust in the next two years. If I them. could cut in real, if I could cut in real brief, briefly, Frank, and thanks for uh, for that point. This reminds me a lot. If you want to be fair, guys, doesn't this remind you a lot of of how you know Justin Verlander's departure from Detroit went? Some kind of way, shape, or form. You're absolutely you want a right. You know, yeah. I mean, a lot of people thought Verlander was was potentially done at that point, and you saw how he turned that around. Now, granted, some of that might have been <clears throat> aided by certain electronic devices. But still, uh, that shouldn't take away to an extent what staff, excuse me, what Verlander himself had done for that team for that year and, and, and in the years since. Yeah, he won a World Series regardless of this cheating scandal. A.J. Hinch won with him. So, question number three. How could the Lions' new coaching staff develop Jared Goff even further? Ed, we'll start with you again. I think they develop him by making him understand that you have to make a better progression with your reads, certain situational moments uh, to where it's going to be incumbent and dependent upon you to make that right move and be the leader of example for your team. That's where Stafford excelled, excuse me, excelled at in his role here that Jared, got, that Jared Goff failed to live up to in Los Angeles. I mean, we can basically say that his most infamous game that people tend to point to as the example of why you can't be counted on as a franchise quarterback is what? How he performed in the Super Bowl. He got big-eyed. Essentially, he was seeing ghosts without saying it the way Sam Darnold would. That's how he performed. He played scared. He played unconfident. He was one of, if not the biggest reason, why St. Louis lost that Super Bowl. Now, granted, I think Belichick's defense deserves a hell of a lot of credit, but still, you got to make the throws in the big game. That's why Tom Brady is a seven-time, excuse me, a six-time Super Bowl champion. That's why he's going for his seventh this Sunday. The the need and the ability to know when the game is on the line, not only make the right play, but the smart play as well, and the play that, hey, you win or lose on me, but I'm going to take that chance for you. We've yet to see Jared Goff do that, and with this new coaching staff around him, with Mark Brunel, with with Dan Campbell, and being reunited with uh, with Brad Holmes to an extent, I think 
could have potential uh, upswings for Jared, Gro- Jared Goff's development and growth. Yeah, I could see that too. Frank, you'd have to agree, right? I fully agree with that 110%. The coaching staff has to build up his confidence because, like you said, in the big games, he played scared. You saw that in the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. And even in the divisional round of the playoffs against the Packers, he didn't really play all that hot either. So you got to build his confidence up, get him to where he's having to make the right plays instead of making these spectacular plays. But I think it all starts with making him confident. Right. Question number four, is the Michigan State Spartans men's basketball team done? We all have to agree with this one. Yes. Ed, we'll start with you again. For this year, at least, yes. Um, I'm not going to full out come out and say that, oh, this is the end of the road for Izzo, because I think you got to t- you have to fairly take into consideration the circumstances that surrounded his whole entire season. Some were, you know, and infected not just Michigan State, infected everyone. And now, granted, some were able to persevere and rise to the top, and kudos to them. But as you can see, it's not that easy with others. And the fact that the head coach himself caught COVID, had to have some type of psychological and mental effect on the team as a whole. Whether you think that's a cop-out or a credible excuse, I'm not the one to debate that. I'm just bringing out uh, what we see on the table and what we saw as a result. We'll call the Michigan sports truth for a reason. This is the reason why. So in terms of why the MSU team performed, that could be a big reason why. Because you know they're much better than this. They have the caliber, the talent, the coaching staff, the program, the tradition to be better than this. So I believe, and and I'm I'm not even a Spartan, but I would be disgusted looking at this season, knowing not just uh, what they've done, but knowing that they can do absolutely better than this. They are much better than this. And I think this year will be seen as more of an uh, an anomaly, more, more so than not. And you just, you know, when everything's said and done, burn everything, put it aside, wash away, Let's look, let's look forward to next season. Yeah, that's kind of what I meant in this question. Frank? To kind of play off what Ed said, since I'm a Michigan State fan, yeah, I am disgusted at the way they've performed this year, but am I going to let it completely ruin and dictate my day? No, I won't. I think it's time to look ahead to next season. And I don't th- And look, I don't think Izzo is completely baked either and done. Because he's got one of the top recruiting classes coming in next year with Max Christie, Pierre Brooks, Jaden Akins, Keon Coleman, who just signed today, might possibly be playing basketball, even though he's also really good in football, could be a two-sport guy, we'll see. And also, if Amani Bates and Enoch Boache end up reclassified to 2021, that will make everything a lot more spectacular. So we'll just kind of see what happens for the rest of this year. I think the tournament's out of the question. I don't think they'll end up taking an NIT bid. They'll just say, you know what? It's been a rough enough year with COVID and all. We're just going to say we're going to end it now, get over it, and look ahead. And also keep in mind, there have been other teams that have been perennially good that have had years like this. I will cite North Carolina after they won the championship in 2009 with a team that probably could have beat some crappy NBA teams. 2009-10 rolls around, they don't even make the tournament. The 2011-12 Kentucky team with Anthony Davis, they win the tournament the next year. Everything goes to hell in a handbasket. They get bounced in the first round of the NIT. So years like this do happen. I'm not saying there's an excuse for any of it, but it's just you have to keep your head down and your eyes forward. Just keep moving along if you want to avoid this. And unfortunately, things happen that may have been unavoidable. So that said, streak is over. It's been impressive, but all streaks are meant to come to an end at some point, whether we like it or not. Yeah, at least they could make the NIT if they were able to. Question number five, who can the Michigan Wolverines football team recruit to replace transfer running back Zach Charbonnet and quarterback Dylan McCaffrey. Ed, we'll start with you again. Well, it depends on if you mean recruit. Well, they already got one coming in Donovan Edwards, so that's your answer right in and there. But in terms of who is already on the roster, uh, I think you can look no further to Hassan Haskins. He, aside from Charbonnet, was, I think, one of the most consistent parts of the Michigan offense, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, last season. I thought he performed well enough, and if, if 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 it's on him now, if it's next man up, I think he'd be more than willing, be willing to answer the call and be that RB one. 
uh, especially uh, in terms of wanting to impress Mike Hart, the new running backs coach. But I would still say keep an eye on Donovan Edwards. I think he has potential to surprise a lot of people. I could see him being no worse than the third string running back. If there is spring or summer practices or whatever, I could see him finding at least starting out as the third string and then eventually working his way up to challenge for the starting running back spot, if not by the end of his of his freshman year, if they don't redshirt him. Right. Frank? Well, as for the running back, like Ed said, I think Donovan Edwards is going to be that guy. He's the best running back in the nation for a reason, and obviously he's going to get more than enough of a shot to crack the rotation. Obviously, you have Hassan Haskins there, but I would say, hey, those two possibly with a little bit of Blake Corum mixed in, will be a nice staple of running backs to pound the rock with. As for replacing Dylan McCaffrey, I think you may have that answer possibly in J.J. McCarthy, who I guess there's a lot of people saying that he's the best thing since sliced bread. I know we've heard that oh line before goodness. with many Enough. a quarterback. Yes, I mean, enough. Ed, we, I don't, Ed, I, oh I'm not God. saying he is. It's, there are How other many Michigan times fans are that are going to go sick. down this well with, these, with, with Michigan fans, okay? Listen, I know that we've had a lot of hype, and then it's gone blowing up in our faces from Shea Patterson to Shane Morris to, to an extent, Wilden Spade, and even, you know, uh, you know, Jake Rudock was at least the most consistently performing dude uh, that Harbaugh's had, if you want to look at things, and Spate as well before he got hurt. But I want to see results. And in terms of what these supposed hype jobs have done at the Michigan QB spot, it's led to nada. I, I, I wanted to see Joe Milton take that next step. He did not. He lost his job as a result. Now, Dylan McCaffrey, he wants to go play and be with his dad. More power to him. Uh, I just want to see who's going to step up, nut up, and lead this damn team. Because you need a leader uh, to be your starting quarterback, especially at a school like this, in a conference like this. And if you're Jim Harbaugh, you're going to frankly gonna have to see it happen. Otherwise, it's your behind that's going to be on the chopping block, on the chopping block and not one of these players tra- transferring. Well, Ed, you took the words right out of my mouth because I was going to say something very similar to that. Yep, sounds like it just did that. So uh, two bonus questions real fast. Who stays longer? Jeff Blaschel or Dwayne Casey, or who will be fired first? Oh, Jeff Blaschel God. or Dwayne Casey? I know they'll both be fired, but uh, hey, got to pick one of the two, right? Ed, we'll start with you again. I, I, so I want to say Blaschel, but I just don't know if Eisman's going to pull the trigger. Like right now, I think maybe. If, unless, well, listen, not right if, now. Right. I wouldn't I count was, on that yet. If I was Eisman, I would give Blaschel to the All Star break. That would be my deadline for him, but I'm not Eisenman, so I can't make that call. But that would be my decision. As for Dwayne Casey, I, I think it's a better chance that Dwayne Casey lasts out unless the team just plays absolute dog crap and shows little to no interest at all, shows no effort, just lays down and dies. I could see Casey being booted uh, before the end of the season. But if I was to pick one, I would lean towards Blasio. Very close, but Blasio, indeed. Frank? I have to go with Blaschel because the Red Wings have pretty much quit on him. And if you keep, if Steve Eisman keeps him around, that's going to turn into much more of a toxic situation. Now, as for Dwayne Casey, I think we do need to keep in mind that Troy Weaver did not hire him to be the coach. So I think that's something we have to consider. It was Tom Gorse. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. But since Weaver's now calling the shots as the GM... How much patience is he going to have with Casey as the head coach? Could he possibly get rid of him before the All-Star game or before season's end? I kind of can buy it, but if you're going to ask me who is more likely to be gone first, it's got to be Blaschel. Yep, we all agree. Jeff Blaschel. Second of two bonus questions, and this is out of our format. We apologize, but Chiefs or Buccaneers in Super Bowl 55? Ed, we'll start with you one last time. Man, this is a very, very tough call. You know how I feel in regards to Tom Brady, but I am a very big fan of Patrick Mahomes. I do believe he is the future of not only this league, but frankly, the future of sports in America. That the way they've been positioning him as, with between his endorsements, his commercials, his likenesses, and now his his this new half billion dollar contract that he extension that he signed last off season, and knowing that how the teams line up 
on paper, you would expect me to pick Kansas City. But I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna be ride or die. I have got to be. I gotta stay as loyal as I can. So I'm probably being foolish with this pick. But just knowing how the fact that the addition of Tom Brady and his essence, his culture, the way he has carried himself and has led, truly led his teammates and his players around him to this spot right now. And what you're the first in the history time in the history of the NFL where the home team gets to literally host the Super Bowl. To me, it's almost like a, a team of destiny type of thing. I don't know how else to explain it, but I'm ride or die. I'm staying loyal to the end. I'm picking my big and predicted score, if you will, as Dusty Rhodes would say. I'm gonna say Tampa or Tampa 34, Kansas City 28. Now, if KC gets over 30 points, I think they'll win. That's why my score, my bet, if you will, hinges on this. Because I think if Tampa can keep the Chiefs under 30 points, they have a very high shot at winning. But if they don't, uh, I think it's the other way around. But gun to my head, I'm going to say Bucks beat the Chiefs 34-28. And Brady gets another Super Bowl MVP. Oh, yeah. Don't forget that Vigit predicted score. Yes, Frank, how about you? I kind of reside in two camps on this. One camp is that I believe Patrick Mahomes is becoming the face of the NFL with his endorsements and the style, his style of play. And, you know, I'm someone who thinks that he plays the game the right way. But I also reside in the camp that Tom Brady is the greatest of all time to play the game. And it's not just because of his six rings. It's because of the culture he has helped bring to Tampa as well. How he learned it in New England and he brought it on here. But I could give you a bunch of stats as to how he has played, even at the age of 43, but I don't need all that ammunition. I only need two things. One, you can never give Tom Brady any kind of advantage. And now he's playing in his home stadium, so there's that. The other is that Kansas City is going to be without their two starting tackles. Mitchell Schwartz has been out for most of the year and isn't close to returning. And also, Eric Fisher, former Central Michigan Chippewa, he blew his Achilles out in the AFC Championship game, so he's not going to be playing. Also, Daniel Kilgore was in COVID protocol, their starting center, Mm. even though I have heard that he might be out of it. Who knows? But the fact that you have two backup offensive tackles going against a pass rush with Shaq Barrett and Jason Pierre-Paul and guys like like, uh, Devin White on defense... And don't forget our old, or, and don't forget our good old buddy and Dominican Sue. Oh yes, and Dominican Sue. I was and his name was on the tip of my tongue. And the Antonio Brown's going to play in the Super Bowl too. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> oh yes. A B's master plan come to fruition. But all, all that, all that aside, if you have backup offensive linemen against one of the top defensive lines in the NFL, and given the way that Tampa's defense has been in or near the top ten of pretty much every category. I also believe that defense is what wins championships. And I'm not going to go and say that the, this is the Buccaneers defense from 2002, 2003 that had three defensive scores in the Super Bowl that year. But I think there is, they're going to make enough plays to stifle Mahomes and frustrate him. My Vigit predicted score for this one is going to be Buccaneers 31, Chiefs 23. Copycat. <laughs> all right i'm gonna sorry this Ed, i wasn't my... trying to price this right you <laughs> right or outbid should we say I'm trying to go but one any... penny lower i see you <laughs> oh yeah oh, Ed. yeah anyway i'm gonna re- i'm gonna range it i'm gonna range in between both your scores with mine i'm gonna go tampa bay buccaneers 33 kansas city chiefs 26 by seven so those are our Vigit predicted scores brought to you by the Vigit Sports app. Referral code Stables for Stables Media. Capital S, lowercase letter B, in the middle. Michigan users can pre-register with its partner BetMGM and make a minimum deposit of $10 in exchange for 2,000 Bitcoins. Take advantage of this opportunity, Michiganders. And that is our episode, by the way. Also, check out the all-new show Hustle and Grind with Joe Madden, Lisa Diaz, and Cam Parsons every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Mountain, and 6 Pacific here on Staples Media. Gentlemen, excellent work as always. That concludes another fine episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Staples Media. We'll be back next week for Ed Smith and Frank Mazur. This is Taylor Phillips signing off. 
Follow me on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at DT2Phillips. Follow Ed Smith on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at EdSmith313. And follow Frank Vazner on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at Frank underscore Vazner, B-A-J-C-N-E-R. Thanks very much for listening, downloading, and sharing. And remember, the truth is out there. TTFN, ta-ta for now. Power the people, hit them with a high, and we rest our case. Stay safe. Enjoy the Super Bowl, everyone. Yes, sir. The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers, nor does it represent or compete against any mainstream media in the state of Michigan. It is also not for entertainment or debating purposes. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And it is for every sports fan's own good because the truth is out there. (laughs) 